Coming up today on Insurance Hour, we have special guest Randall Bennett. He's going to talk with us about the future of reinsurance and how that affects your insurance premium. Buckle up, everyone. You are strapped in and ready for the Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman, informing, educating, and entertaining Californians one policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. Hello, hello, welcome. This is Carl Sussman, and you are tuned into Insurance Hour with me, your host. Today, we have an extremely special guest that is going to be talking to us about all of the things that he has done, including explaining some insurance concepts that I know we talk about with a lot of frequency. Now we can hear about it specifically from someone that has worked in that environment. Remember, if you have questions, you can call in at 559-656-0317 or always send questions to questions at insurancehour.com. So with a very little introduction, because I just want to get into it and and, and talk, we have with us today Randall Bennett. He is he's previously the VP of Strategic Partnership with Swiss Re. He's worked for Allstate, Encompass, Nat General. He's worked with insure tech companies and general agents of all sorts. And right now he is in his latest and greatest, which is called Quicksent. And I will welcome you and, and let's let's jump right in and talk about that. Yeah, thank you for having me. So yeah, Quicksent is uh, where I'm at today. Quicksent is what I'm doing in the latest. Quicksent is a consulting firm that focuses on property and casualty inside of the U.S. And what we do is we like to bring new ideas and new ventures into the market. So we focus with uh, established insurance companies and kind of insurance adjacent companies to help them launch their new insurance ventures. So when you say insurance adjacent, are you talking about about products that someone just has an idea of and they want to find the distribution system for that? Or what exactly does that mean? Yeah, precisely. So that's exactly the case. So if it's someone who has an idea for insurance or has this idea, we'll help them take the, the idea from process to product to profit to try to implement that idea and put it in place. And then if it's someone who actually has a, a full vertical, let's say that perhaps you do um, inspections for homeowners, and you see a a pathway for that to be used in insurance, we'll help you explore that idea, explain that venture, what it would take to launch that venture, and get you a feasibility and get you launched and going. Now, are you working with angel investors, or are you fully funded and you bring everyone under your umbrella, or how does that normally work? That's a great question. So, no, it is it is just me. So, I am I am out here doing this uh, kind of with my own uh, my own seed capital from from my own pocket. Um, we have a small team that that are hyper focused in on what we try to do for our clients, and it's uh, I mean it's a lot of flexibility and it's a lot of like um, uh, custom custom work and solutions that we're doing. So there's no need for really seed capital or investors at this stage. And ideally, our clients have all that taken care of for us. <laughs> they, they always say the best partners are me, myself, and I. <laughs> so as long as you can keep it that way, that, that is always the best. And, and with all honesty, when we're done with this, I have someone to send to you that's working on a product that is literally happening as we speak. So I should definitely um, get them right to you. Uh, You see, I I like to wait and not do a lot of research with people I'm going to be speaking with because I like to find out and give my honest, you know, feedback. And this is exciting. I love it. Because these days there truly is such a different environment than we've been in, literally, that that there is a there's a dying need for new products, for new ways to underwrite them, for new ways to price them, and and I'm I'm excited about that. Do you have any particular um, products or types of companies that you that you've worked with so far, or that are sort of on the drawing board? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing that I'm seeing in the industry right now, and I think a lot of um, I get a lot of excitement about and see a lot of uh, I guess traction on is risk mitigation. So from any different perspective, if it's before it was kind of understanding the risk, identifying the risk, underwriting the risk, uh, pricing the risk and having an insurance policy. But I think there's a little bit more that's being required up front when it comes to mitigating that risk on the front end. Like if you're based out in California and you have wildfire hazards, how much how much are you aware of your own risks? How much have you done to mitigate those risks before you even apply for the insurance policy? And then going forward, how are you going to maintain and monitor those risks? So I think risk mitigation is something that's highly, uh, highly important, impactful, and coming alive right now. There's no question about it. And I think that there there's a fundamental shift that's going to start happening between 
oh, I don't have to worry about that because if I've uh, if there's a loss, I have insurance for that. That mindset, which That's has right. always existed, to the what can I do to prevent the loss? Because that's going to cost less in premium. It's going to do all these you know, better things in the long run. And I think some people tend to forget the ideal is no loss. I mean, loss is bad, right? You, you, you don't want to have a loss. If you can do things to prevent it, you should. And, I, and it's funny because sometimes we actually forget that, I think, as a society in general, that insurance is the safety net. Right, it's it's not designed to be anything but the safety net. So I think as time is going by and prices of insurance are going up, and in part due to reinsurance, and, and I want to talk about that in a moment, people are going to realize that well, if I can save money by doing what they really should have already been doing, right, doing taking some steps to make their homes, you know, they call it home hardening, to be less likely to burn, things like that. We're going to get discounts for that. We're going to save money. Sometimes money is a good motivator, right? If it's not just to do the right thing, it actually, if it can save you money, that sometimes can motivate people as well. As a matter of fact, in California, the Department of Insurance has a new um, new law that's actually in effect where admitted insurers have to submit, and this happened last was it just in January? I think their their initial volley was due. Every carrier had to submit some type of a discount formula for if people did X, Y, and Z things, they will get X percent off of their property insurance. And so far, of all of the carriers that submitted and all the organizations, one has had their uh, request approved, and that's the California Fair Plan. Uh, interestingly enough, so uh, it turns out that the other, I guess everybody else, the Department of Insurance looked at and either said, well, that's too much for them to do, or it's not enough of a discount for them to do, let's think about it again. And then just because of the general shortage of insurance, I think that's sort of taking a back burner at this point, but we'll definitely get back to it. And the concept of rewarding people for trying to prevent loss is, it's strange for me to say it, it's, it's a new concept. And I've never understood that. There's, there's always discounts when they look at what you have, right? They take a snapshot, here's the risk, and based on what you have, here's the price. This concept of, but if you do these other things, we can lower your rate, that seems to be something new. And I think that that accountability that we're going to start seeing is going to be amazing. Because I know that with the prices going up, countrywide, actually worldwide, for, for property and casualty insurance, which is a fancy word for saying things like fire and, and theft and intangibles. I'm saying that for, you know, for people that are paying attention. Um, they want to do things to lower that price again, right? And right now we are feeling, uh, we're feeling the effects of, of inflation and all sorts of other complex issues that affect the insurance market. The way I try and sort of distill it down is I say, well, you know, we're all complaining that everything's more expensive. I mean, you go to Subway, it's more expensive. You get gas, it's more expensive. Forget going to the movie. I, I can't even believe how expensive it is just to go to the movies now. How everything is expensive. Well, remember our insurance policies are actually buying all of those things for us when we have a loss. So it's, it's sort of hard to imagine that since they have to pay for all of those things that we all agree have gotten really expensive, well, of course the premium is going to reflect that. So to try and find other ways to lower that premium back down is going to be the new, I hate to say the new theme, but the, 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 new, the new theme and the expression I hate, the new normal that, that we see looking forward. I really love the way you put that, if I may say. That was absolutely excellent. I also think that um, if I might add, because this has been a bit of a, a thorn in my side that I've had with the industry for a while, all of the work that the kind of the, the major carriers have done, and I won't say any names, but we all know them because we see the commercials uh, that have done in terms of save 15 minutes in order to save X amount of dollars, up to $500 on your next uh, auto insurance or homeowners insurance, et cetera, et cetera. It has created, it has helped to create this problem. Um, the high expenses and the high amount of commercials for insurance that we saw constantly advertising price, 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 price has created this scenario where price became the leading uh, factor for consumers. And then as the market wins and as the situation changed, we were no longer able to use price as a leading indicator. We were no longer able to price as low as possible. And so it's made this incredibly toxic 
kind of relationship with insurance or at least exacerbated it and made it worse um, because everyone was saying your price shouldn't be more than $100 or your expectation should be this. And now everyone is upset. So the way that you've put this in terms of what you're paying for has gone up. So insurance companies, what they're paying for has also gone up means that all of this is on the rise, 100%. It is. And, you know, we're going to take a quick break now, but when we come back, I'm going to give you one other example that I like to use to explain why we, well, how did we get here, right? Because this is not how insurance policies always were. There, there was a time, and it wasn't that long ago, when people utilized their insurance policies, their expectations for what their policies would cover was different than it is today. We'll talk about that when we come right back. Facing the maze of California's insurance market? Let Sussman Insurance Agency be your ally. Expertise in all personal insurance needs for over two generations. Call 877-411-5200 or visit sussmaninsurance.com. Together, we can do this. Hello, hello, and welcome back to Carl Sussman at Insurance Hour with my special guest today, Randall Bennett. Still here, right? Still there? Absolutely. All right, terrific. I promised before the break I was going to give you another, not another, but an idea of how we try and explain to consumers this this change we've had, this fundamental shift in how insurance is utilized. And I always look at the health insurance market. Health insurance used to be for something really bad. You know, you get hit by a truck, you go into the hospital, you need surgery. That's what it was used for. And then competition started to, to get into play. And they said, well, maybe we'll pay if you're not just at the hospital, but if you go to the doctor and you have something major happen, we'll pay. And then later it became, well, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you can just pay a percentage of it. Competition wiggled through that a little bit. We've gotten to the point now where our expectation is we should just be able to pick any doctor, go to any doctor for any reason, and just have it paid for. This concept of co-pays and co-insurance and picking doctors in network and the gatekeeper concept of who you can go to and who you can't, this is all our own doing because our expectation has changed so much from what this original policy was, which was, I just hit, got hit by a Mack truck and I need surgery, to, I kind of have the sniffles, so I want to go to that doctor and I want to pay oh, 30 bucks for my copay, and I want you to run every test and see me and be available tomorrow and blah, 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 blah. And that's one of the reasons we see our health insurance market in shambles because that expectation is so out of line with what the correct actual concept was initially for health insurance. Now we're in this battle between, well, what should we be expecting? And, and to your point before, what is the right cost, right? What do we think is a reasonable cost to have that the type of policy that we want to have? Yeah, I think that's another great example. It's become a lot more comprehensive, right? And that value needs to be demonstrated more often and more frequently. And so, yeah, you're absolutely right. Now, we talked about, we keep alluding to, to reinsurance. And the way I just, you know, in simple terms, talk to people about reinsurance is I say, this is where insurance carriers go, in essence, to insure, you know, to, to, off, to, to offload some of their risk, right? To share the risk. Why don't you give us a little bit of background about how reinsurance works, why it's good, how, about why spreading the risk is good, and, and a little bit more, if you can, from on reinsurance. Yeah, absolutely. So it, exactly to your point, in the, in the simplest of ways, reinsurance is insurance for insurance companies, right? Uh, it allows them to say, I have a hundred, let's call it millions, a hundred million uh, dollars worth of premium on, I don't know, a thousand different uh, policies in Iowa. And I am uh, uh, concerned that at any point a tornado could come through and wipe out the entire book, or it could wipe out a, a large, significant size of that book. Um, what I want to do is instead of uh, being on the hook for that entire 100 million, I'd like to share some of that 100 million with a larger insurance company that has 12 billion in Iowa and say, okay, well, I wanna give you 20%. So that way, at the end of the day, I know, worst case scenario, I lose $80 million, and that's something that I can stomach a little bit more than $100 million. And this is 
really high numbers and this is really kind of abstract, but in theory, that's effectively what it is. They don't want to be on the hook for all of these policies in this single state. And it can be incredibly risky if one single event happens and puts their entire company at risk. And so, please, Carl. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm listening. And you, you said by state. Now, reinsurers can vary by by company or by a particular product line. It, it, there's there's nothing that says they have to. It's a take all market. It's it's very granular. And I wanted you to speak to a little bit about how that works and how if they're giving 20% of the premium away to get rid of 20% of the risk, how there are actually costs. It sounds so peachy keen, right? Everybody wins. You take some of the premium, you pay some of the claims, but there's a cost associated with that. And we're all feeling that. So I just want to be sure that we touch on that as well. You're absolutely right. So there is a cost associated with it. And it it, it all gets very um, kind of, you can cut this up and dice it in almost any way that you want. You can have insurance contract, you can have reinsurance agreements because this is what it becomes an agreement between two insurance companies um, effectively. And you can say, I want to only cover this state. I want to cover this entire country. I want to cover this product regardless of geography of where it is. Um, I want to cover these different products. I want to cover any policy that comes in uh, from this from this company, period. So there's all these different ways and minutia that you can get into. Then you can have a percentage base, which we typically call quota share. Um, and that says, I will cover a percentage of whatever larger portfolio you are, exp- you are passing over to me. And then there's another one where it's called facultative, where we will cover different periods of claims. So maybe you'll have a facultative program that says this uh, is a stop loss uh, reinsurance policy that doesn't, that covers any claims that are for a wildfire event that are above $10 million, but less than $40 million. And so you have these layers that go into it is what they end up calling reinsurance layers. And as events like let's say a major wildfire in nevada uh start to go oh, thank up. you for not saying in california yes they do actually happen in other places thank you so much randall you just you made my day <laughs> my pleasure okay let's talk about the theoretical wildfire there so a theoretical wildfire in in nevada might come in where it starts in just a single neighborhood and it burns down a home uh or it it causes damage to a home and not even burn it down the insurance company will pay for that entire loss. Then let's say this wildfire becomes uncontrolled and it starts to envelop the entire neighborhood. Then it starts to go up and it's getting to maybe a million dollars worth of losses. Then it starts to uncover the entire zip code. Then it's starting to get creeping up towards $10 million. At $10 million, this is where this new reinsurance uh, agreement will come into play. And this reinsurer will say, okay, you've paid everything up to $10 million. Now I'm on the hook for the next $10 million to $90 million. Now let's say it started to develop the entire county. And so now it's creeped past I'm getting goosebumps. You got you, you, you got this is killing me hearing about all these fires exactly. getting bigger and bigger. Exactly. So that now it's yeah. going past a hundred million dollars. And now this wildfire uh, is is now the reinsurance company has said, okay, well, our policy is exhausted. We're no longer on the hook. At that point, it either reverts back to the insurance carrier to cover all of those losses in excess of a hundred or it goes to the next reinsurer that is on the hook. And that's this kind of layers of reinsurance and layers of, of coverage that happens there. It's interesting. I didn't, I didn't even think about bringing that up, that you can have, the, one insurance company can, like you're saying, layer reinsurance. They could literally say, for this amount, I want this reinsurer. For that amount, I want that reinsurer. So explain why reinsurance is so important to keeping solvency and the concept of spreading risk among multiple carriers. Yeah, absolutely. So it really, it, it allows you to kind of leverage um, your reserves is, is effectively what you're doing. You're allowing $1 um, which has to be put into reserves to cover amount of claims to be leveraged more and more and more by getting more participants to put in their dollars is effectively how this works. And so if we want to see more coverage in California, we get more reinsurers that participate, we get more kind of capacity, and we get more insurance 
companies that are willing to offer coverages because they know that they are going to sh- they have a partner to share in some of those losses. And to your point, this is uh, I'm presenting this all in a very um, kind of uh, high level and and happy view. But yes, there is a cost to all of this, and reinsurers want a percentage of a fee. They want 3%, they want 5%, they want 6%, and then they want this profitability to be maintained. So they expect, no matter what, they're walking away with maybe upwards of 9% of underwriting profits. So that way, if you write a hundred um, a hundred million dollars, well, let's say a hundred dollars worth of insurance, they know they're walking away with $91. And then that is on you, the insurance company, to figure out how to make sure they get their 9%. Regardless of what happens, loss one. Precisely. So they'll have a clawback provision uh, most often, which is where they will take back to make sure that they are set. And if they can't get back their, their, their required return, the retired minimum, then the policy ends after a year and they will not renew the policy because it's been unprofitable. So in, in our peachy, you know, keen view, right? We started out with 100% of the premium goes to the insurance company and they take 20% of that premium and they give it to this other company and they pay 20% of the claims and everybody's happy. But there's more to it than that. They, you're saying that this reinsurer is going to actually want, they're going to take on 20% of the risk but they're going to charge, in essence, more than 20% of that premium or dollars coming from that initial carrier are going to exceed that 20% in premium in coverage that they're actually taking on, upwards of close to 10%. Now, this is something we hear about because we hear that the reinsurance costs are going up, the reinsurance costs are going up. Can you give us a, you know, what are the last five years, what are the last 10 years look like roughly when it comes to what that percentage is and how difficult is it for the average carrier to get a a reinsurance treaty? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the the percentage that reinsurers typically focus on is how much of the risk that they're going to take on. So are they going to take on, on that quota share example, are they going to take on 20%? Six years ago, it was pretty easy for you to have a new insurance idea and you could come in with some insurance partners and then get upwards of 100% of reinsurance coverage, meaning that- So literally the the insurer that's selling the product is, has no skin in the game. Completely. Actually. That's exactly the case. That's exactly the case. That is exactly the term that reinsurers like to use as well as skin in the game. And so six years ago, you could get this done because it was a new world. Um, There, there weren't too many people that were coming in that had this uh, hockey stick growth idea or this VC capital money. It was- only people that really understood and knew insurance that were starting insurance companies at the time. Now go back to 2021 and we see kind of the the peak, I believe, of the insurance investment in the market that was happening uh, over the last six years in insurtechs. And at that peak, we started to see a lot of losses start to come in. We started to see a lot of uh, new Claims insurtechs. actually happen. It, Claims and just as happen. a footnote, I promise we'll get into insure tech for people that are that are paying close attention. They might insure tech. Ah, thank We're going to hit on that. I promise. I apologize. So, but these, no, no, that's great. The, the, we, you know what? It's all about information. So I, I just want to make sure that we don't lose anyone thinking now I'm lost in sure tech. We will get to that. So, yes. So so these new so the new dollars that were flowing in all with all these grandiose ideas and plans all of a sudden had a little reality check basically you're saying and claims were happening precisely in, at more frequency and severity perhaps than they were they were expecting precisely the case and then so insurance comp- or so reinsurance companies started to see their their costs go up they weren't able to recoup the profitabilities that they were expecting and so what they've started to do now is they've started to do it's to me I see zero uh, companies that come across with 100% quota share, 100% reinsurance. At this point now, you have to have skin in the game in order to get a reinsurance policy. And before, it might be dominated by one reinsurer, where one reinsurer is going to cover 80% of your policies, but now that's being broken up into a panel. And so now reinsurance is being covered 20% 20% by this company, 10% by this company, 40% by this company, and then 20% by you. So it becomes a lot harder to get a single uh, reinsurer panel, and it becomes a lot, it's impossible to get a panel without having any kind of uh, um, 
steak. This layering that you're talking about. So it, it went from being able to have basically 100% of what it is you're trying to do insured elsewhere down to now you have to have at least 20% of your own, you know, skin in the game, right? Like we keep saying. And on top of that, it's not just one reinsurer or one reinsurer treaty that you have to come up with. You may have to layer that with two, three, four, five to get to those levels. Is that, that's actually what's happening? That's exactly the case. That's exactly the case for all of the new ones. And then on top of that, right, that is, that is just getting the reinsurer to come to the table. You need to have a lot more reinsurance. You need to have a lot more insurance experience. So you need to have experience running a profitable book. You need to have experience in years of doing uh, rate changes, of, of rule changes, of monitoring insurance programs and knowing what the key performance indicators are for a successful insurance program before these they actually want somebody with experience i I can't understand why these companies that all this money would want to have somebody running the programs with their dollars at the stake that have experience randall that just blows my mind well you know for all of those companies that maybe have been thinking about doing insurance but don't have the experience please give me a call at quicksent and we can be sure to to give you some (laughs) of that experience that you can borrow you know I hate, I hate to say this, but I know what your answer is going to be. So it used to be you could layer one company. And we already established they wanted to get a nice chunk of change out of it. Up somewhere it's upware of 10%. If you're talking about layering two, three, four, five, is it safe to say that each one of those layers is going to be taking a little bit more of your profit out of that as well? That's exactly the case. So, I mean, it, it usually cumulate, accumulates at 10%, right? So that's usually the peak where you're going to see. But even still, if you're writing, you know, $100 on an insurance policy and $10 are gone off the top, that is immediately you're left with $90. And that makes it, I mean, that makes it a little bit harder. $90 to still try and make an underwriting profit on. Correct. Correct. It's like having a guaranteed 10% loss before you've even sold a policy. Precisely. So when we hear that the cost of reinsurance has gone up, it's not even specifically that percentage, but the fact that there are multiple percentages now that have to be Mm -hmm. included in order to reach the thresholds to satisfy all of them. Because if one of those layers falls out, then the whole deal falls apart. Is that right? Exactly. And these reinsurance companies, they're, they're massive bank accounts, right? So when they say the cost of insurance, the reinsurance has gone up, also what, what you need to hear there is by them deploying that capacity to you as an insurance company, they are earmarking that for you and they can't do anything else with it. And right now we're seeing some of the financial markets go up, right? So we're seeing, um, we're seeing interest rates increase. So they could, in theory, put the money into a, a, a CD and buy some treasury bonds that would earn better profitability than your brand new insurance idea. So that's that's inherent in some well, of the Well, right. Costs. That's the investment income aspect that comes in, right? I mean, Precisely. back in the 80s when interest rates were, you know, 15, 18%, an insurance company could run literally at an underwriting loss. They could pay out, they could have a 110% loss ratio, right? They're, they're collecting 1,000, they're paying out 1,100. Didn't matter because they could take that money in the meantime and make 20% on it somewhere else. Precisely. We are even with interest rates having done what they've done, we're still nowhere near that. And, and again, you're saying that now we have these additional layers, these additional costs, and all of it really balancing on a pinhead. Because if one of those reinsurers decides for some reason to get squeamish, then the whole deal falls apart. That's precisely the case. And it is not fun when your reinsurance panel falls apart. I can tell you that from uh, having heard from firsthand when your reinsurer drops and you have to figure out how to fill this panel. Now, how does it work sometimes when you might hear that an insurance company is offering a policy, but you've never heard of them? And it's, well, that's because it's a reinsurer specifically. How does a, a reinsurer decide whether they're going to basically be the behind the scenes wallet or whether they're actually going to be the forward facing company to the consumer? Yeah, that's a great question. So typically the reinsurer that you've never heard of is not offering insurance policy themselves, right? So the primary insurance uh, company would either be a company you've heard of or a company that is 
um, almost acting as someone to lend your license to. So to put this into something that's a bit of a maybe a layperson's term, imagine if someone that didn't have a driver's license could borrow your driver's license and go out and drive any vehicle that they want. That is what ends up happening with some of these insurance companies that you've never heard of. There is an actual insurance company sitting behind the scenes that is fully licensed and admitted in all 50 states. And what they are doing is they are lending their license to maybe Carl, who has a great idea for an insurance company, but isn't going to go and get his own insurance license until this idea proves out a bit. So that's where this comes into play. So you could offer maybe the insurance, our uh, renter's insurance program, and then you can go and borrow the insurance license of a company that is specifically um, in, interested in loaning their license out left and right. And then you can start selling your own insurance that day using that insurance company as your, as your partner. Interesting. So that becomes the paper that it's, the policies are being written on. Precisely. I got gotcha. you. Interesting. So when it ta- I don't want to beat reinsurance to death, but I can't help it because it's, it's, it's so important. And there are states that will allow insurance companies to take that additional cost, that new layering that we're talking about, and everyone t- getting their beaks wet along the way. And they'll take that additional cost and they'll, they're allowed to utilize that in justifying the rates that they're charging the consumers. Some states like California do not allow that. When, what, do, what does an insurance carrier do when they're seeing their rate, their reinsurance costs go up and they're not able to pass that cost on in policy premiums? That's a great question. So uh, I think first we have to establish what that means in terms of passing along that rate. Um, every insurance company has to submit their cost structure and their pricing to the state for review. And so when they submit their pricing to the state, they have to indicate how much that insurance has, uh, the price of their insurance program has gone up, right? And so in theory, they might move their insurance product overall upwards of 2%, 5%. That's generally about where it is. If, it, if, if the, in overall the insurance product has become more than 15%, um, or more than 10% expensive, they have to get that specifically approved by the state. And those become long and, and laborious and, and things that uh, insurance companies will try to avoid as much as possible. So knowing that, understand there that you're only looking at the overall number. So again, insurance our uh, renter's insurance may say that we've increased our rates by 2%. That does not mean that any person applying for insurance for the insurance hours, uh, renters in, insurance is only seeing a 2% increase. That could mean that I was lucky enough to fall into the category that saw a 20% increase. But in overall, because insurance hour, renters insurance has been so successful, it only looks like 2% overall. So what an insurance company will try to do is they'll take that rate increase and they'll pinpoint it into the different areas that need rate increases the most or they'll they'll try to be more granular with it precisely or they'll put it into areas that they no longer really want to be in business in right so maybe they they see in particular um one zip code has been incredibly challenging uh in nevada and so they no longer. Poor Nevada. What do you have against Nevada? Well, you don't want to be. Everyone against, loves Nevada. You, you don't want to be against California. So let's maybe let's do Illinois. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> so we we take the brunt of everything as it is. You're right. Okay, Nevada, it is. Okay, so maybe Nevada. There's been one specific zip code that has been particularly troublesome. So they will increase the rates there by maybe twelve percent, and then they will also decrease the amount of uh, marketing that they do in that zip code, or they'll reduce the number of- They're trying to lower their expenses to offset that additional cost. Precisely. So it becomes this, uh, a lot of levers that insurance companies can pull. And and those are the jobs of, of product managers and the product development team and actuaries in order to pinpoint where and how to make those changes. 
Now, we're seeing this happening, obviously, in California. We're seeing it in Texas, in Florida, in Oklahoma, in Colorado. I mean, we're seeing it everywhere. And that is because the reinsurance market is not in the States necessarily, it's it's global. So can you explain how these, you know, potentially a warehouse fire in Taiwan might actually have an impact on what you're paying for your home insurance in, oh, I don't know, Nevada? Well, I will tell you uh, as, as a caveat to this, it's not as global as I wanted it to be. <laughs> mm. Yeah, so the, there's, it is just the, the, the amount of information that's available across regions is not as universal as I would like to see, right? So when I, when I was doing this uh, within reinsurance and I was looking at it globally and I wanted it to be more global for some of our bigger customers, it is just too localized um, because values and numbers mean different things in different, in different locales. So it's not as much as you would think. That being said, if as a reinsurance company, we have a global kind of um, homeowner's market that's all being measured together, if one local locality and geography has had a massive amount of claims and severity has gone well up, then that decreases the amount of risk pool and that this decreases the amount of money that I have available for the other localities within that homeowners. So to your point, it does put a cap on how much I can pull, pull out of this pool for that locality and for that region. But for right. not only themselves. is the de- not only is the supply drying up because it's being utilized, there's probably even more demand at the same time because there are more claims happening. So it's a double-edged sword. We're, we're seeing when you see when you when you see the, the reinsurer get hit, they have to pay out more. That means they have less that they can reinsure, which means the remaining carry uh, reinsurers will charge more because there's a shortage in the market. Precisely. So it feeds on itself. Precisely. That is exactly the case. But unfortunately, like I said, to me, unfortunately, rather, I can't use the information that's happening in uh, a monsoon in Thailand to, to prepare for the uh, the upcoming winter or hurricane season in Texas. Unfortunately, the, the Department of Texas will not allow that. <laughs> Interesting. Do you know offhand how many states is it predominant? Or is it the exception that a state will allow the reinsurance costs to be part of the rating model? Well, I mean, I, I would say every state will allow you to put in your costs, um, and it just depends on how much of how much of that you're defining, right? So if it becomes just a a plug that says our cost to sell this insurance policy is twenty three dollars. Then it becomes the state to ask, okay, why is it $23? Explain this cost plug a little bit further. Um, But typically, every every state is going to allow you to put in your cost. Some just don't care, basically. But they'll they'll let you put it in there. What what else is interesting about this is when when rates, we we hear people saying this all the time, because whenever you hear someone talk about it's the, it's the national or the international reinsurance market that's gone up and that's affecting dot, 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 they say, well, then just don't get reinsurance. Now, I understand why that's a bad idea, especially for consumers and companies, but I want to have you clarify it in, in your way. Why, why don't insurance carriers just say, hey, this used to be easy, 80-20, maybe an extra 10%, but now with all these other layers and everyone wanting a piece of the action, just not worth it. I'll just take the risk myself. Why is that a bad idea? I mean, the biggest idea is uh, as, as big as the biggest idea is just solvency, right? The biggest idea is, do you have enough cash on hand to be able to cover all of this? And I think by nature, insurance companies are constantly looking to diversify their portfolio and they want to get into, um, more business in new areas and they want to spread their risk as much as they can. And all of these insurance companies are very good at managing risk. And so they understand the risks that are in place from going into these new areas that they do not have experience with or they have limited experience with and trying to, to get more insurance premium out of it. So if you go without reinsurance, 
you are taking on a massive amount of risks that typically insurance companies are just going to say, no, thank you. We, we don't want that amount of risk to come into play. So, um, going without reinsurance, it is, it makes sense in certain situations, but it is very hard to do. Probably makes sense when it's a very small amount of exposure to the company. Whereas if it's a large percentage of exposure or the potential for loss is great, they could literally be putting the solvency of the entire company on the line. We've seen in 2023, I believe it was seven or eight carriers in Florida become insolvent, mm -hmm. seven or eight. Whereas that's not normal. <laughs> you know, we, we don't see companies that literally run out of money. Mm -hmm. And now you're in a situation where so many carriers have either run out of money and left or simply like you're saying, or said, I, I can't do this anymore. I can't afford to be here. They've stopped offering policies or are pulling out of the state in, in general. You're left with the, the state itself, citizens it's called, being the largest insurer in the state, which I always find kind of amusing because of all places, right? Florida, you know, everything is you know, freedom, freedom, no matter what, at, at all costs. But you have to have your insurance with the state. You know, we're going to decide what the cost is. And, and interestingly enough, you probably know this, but it, it blew me away to hear. Did you know that they had to take out a credit line before last season? So let me get this straight. The private markets have left or gone bankrupt. The state takes over and says, okay, we'll write the policies. Oh, but by the way, we don't have enough money. So we're going to take out a credit line so that we hopefully have money in case there's claims. This sounds like a bad idea. Am I missing something? No, I, I, I think you've incredibly captured it that I think uh, is beautiful. I wish everyone that listens listens to some of like uh, the NPR podcast and local reporting podcasts about how insurance companies have done a bad job would have, would hear this way that you've put it because yeah, it's, it's the, the homeowners insurance market in the state of Florida has become incredibly hard to do business in. And I don't understand how we have let it get to this point. Um, and I think that it's on uh, the leadership in Florida that has kind of allowed this to happen. And it's created situations where even in, in theory, like you said, a, a company like Citizens that has zero, uh, like has just completely unfettered resources, as many resources as it could want, has to pull a line of credit in order to be able to cover all of the claims. It's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, it, it's, it's bizarre. It's, it's definitely bizarre. So this has all been pretty gloom and doom. And, and it's, but, it, but this is where we are. This is the reality that we're, we're working in right now. So before I talked about, before we talk about what do we think is coming next or what, what is coming next, I had mentioned InsureTech. And I, I want to be sure that we circle back to that so everyone can sort of get a taste for what the heck that is. So tell us what, what does it stand for? What does it mean? And what's the general philosophy behind any InsureTech company? Yeah, so insured tech became this uh, as a term that's really now used as a catch-all for a new insurance company uh, that is that has a technological acumen is really what this means. Uh, so it started off by saying you were a tech company that was offering insurance, or you were an insurance company that was equally invested in technology. Um, that was the the very beginning and the start of it, but then quickly people started to realize oh, so this is every insurance company because technology is kind of key within insurance. Uh, but so today, what it really means- You're not means, so special after all, you mean. Exactly, exactly. It was this idea, we're gonna change the world, we're gonna revolutionize insurance, and then it's like, oh wait, you're, you're an insurance company. And so <laughs> uh, now it's a catch-all for those that are kind of new entrants or that are looking at this um, with a new lens and a new perspective that says technology on day one is, a, is an integral part of our insurance program. And that's what insurance is, insure tech is. So it's not, as some people think, all AI or all automation, no people, no oversight, just, you know, what goes through the algorithm comes out and that's the end of it. it it's still, these are still insurance companies run by people, underwritten by humans with potentially more than average, is that a fair way of putting it? Use of technology. There's actually an insurance carrier, the name is escaping me, where their, their pitch to us as brokers is, 
we are a technology company first and an insurance company second. Mm. And it's interesting because they claim that they they can predict and their model, everyone thinks their model is the best, right? Let's face it. Everyone thinks they've got the best model until the claims start coming in. But so in general, there's nothing special or unique about it in insure tech company. It's just a company that might rely more heavily on technology than you know a, a company that's been around for 200 years that it's just done in the culture yeah i think i think the the culture is exactly the thing i was going to say right the culture becomes a little bit different um i think that i talk about this a lot with my different clients and in, in, in the industry um your insurance companies that have been around for 100 years, 200 years, they were so focused on their insurance product. It became, hey, we want this. And they said, well, I can't do that because this is what the states allow me to do. And insure techs are really good at saying, hearing their customers say, hey, we want this and trying to figure out a creative way to get them what they want. Maybe it's not exactly what they want. Maybe it's not what they thought they wanted at the beginning, but it's like, oh, this is in essence what you wanted. And they're doing a really good job of that. So the culture is a bit different in terms of where they're focusing and they're doing a lot more customer centric approach. That reminds me, I think it was Henry Ford has a famous quote that he said he used to always hire young engineers because they didn't know it couldn't be done. So they just did it. Yeah. And, and, and that reminds me of that, that you know, what the customers want figure out a way to do it exactly. right and and if and, and there's always there's always a way if you if you look hard enough right and and you price things properly and it goes back to again our talk about expectations right you can't have an expectation to pay $100 for something when the exposure is 10 million we know that there's somewhere in between, right? But it, it's, again, part of our culture and society in general to have an expectation. We're using all the same words over and over, but it's true to be able to pay as little as possible and get as much as possible and some. And, and, and not even necessarily feeling that we're bad or greedy. I hate to use the word entitled. Maybe it's there's some truth to it, right? Like I said, some people do view insurance as a savings account versus a safety net. And I think that's permeating the, you know, everyone, every, everything. It's, it's creating the environment that we're trying to change, right? Because that, that environment has helped put us in this position to begin with. Um, tell me a little bit about what you think. What's next? What, what is going to start happening where is the light at the end of the tunnel? And most importantly, what can people that are paying attention actually do to try and help move things in the right direction? Yeah, so I said one of them earlier. I think risk mitigation, and you touched on it, is is incredibly important in what's going to be the future. Um, and it's happening, like you said, in California with the new law and focusing on risk mitigation and discounts that are available when they perform some of these risk mitigation services. I think that AI... Um, is going to continue to increase, right? And we're going to continue to figure out how to use AI, how it can be used to help people. I think that the best way and the most likely use case in the immediate future is as a co-pilot, quote unquote, meaning that it's not going to replace your job, but it's going to come in and just make your job a whole lot easier where you're coming in and it just brings, imagine just someone sending you instant messages uh, while you're on a claims call or while you're doing a sales pitch to a new client and it's just sending you little notes to say, hey, ask them about this. Hey, make sure you check on this. Hey, we already oh, got this. Oh, you mean this. like being married? <laughs> kind of like that. Okay. I, 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 there was something familiar about that and it just re I just realized, okay, yeah, I, 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 I hear you. Ideally less defensive, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> right. And so, so, yeah, so it's the idea is that they will start offering you, kind of helping you along the way, making your job a lot easier. You don't have to take as many notes and, it, and it'll be a, a, an overall lift to your job, your happiness, and your productivity. Um, we're also seeing a lot less deals that are happening year over year. So just off the top, when it comes to like property and casualty, those insure techs that we talked about, uh, last year there was 25% less than what there was in 2022. The number mm. of exits, like the number of companies that left after doing an IPO or doing uh, a, a purchase, fell 30% year over year from 23 to 2022. Fell meaning more of them failed or M fell meaning, meaning that less happened, right? So I there see. was less insurance, insure tech deals and there was less insure tech exits. So there was less insure techs that got, you know, 
a hundred million dollars for their board or their co-founders to walk away and retire on a beach, right? There's 30% less of those. And what I think that means is that- Breaks my heart. (laughs) Yours too, I'm sure. All of us, all of us. Yeah. (laughs) And so there's there's less- I think there's less just really money for the sake of money and seeing this green opportunity and a lot more people that are going to be focused on solving insurance and that are here for the long haul and that have really good ideas and really smart ideas and are really focused in on what they're doing. So I think that that means a very kind of bright future for those that do see investment in this year and next year going forward. So it's interesting. So you see technology as really being kind of a as, as stepping in to be able to solve some of these problems that we're having because let's face it we, people have gotten us into this place right so if, if we can find a smarter way out of it we should embrace that you're saying completely i think that's absolutely the case and i think that you've seen a lot of embedded insurance opportunity i don't know if you've talked about that how much on the show but this idea being that uh, Tesla insurance, for example, Tesla, if you bought a new Tesla, you could get insurance directly through Tesla and not have to go to Allstate. I think you'll see a lot more of those deals start to pop up. And I think those inherently become less expensive for the customer because they don't have to worry. Tesla doesn't need to worry about marketing. They don't need to worry about spending for additional dollars to get insurance customers into the door. It is just an add-on service on top of their core solution that are, are their core product that makes it a lot less, uh, a lot more affordable. It's an interesting example because they haven't been doing very well. They um, have not. They have not. And again, I the concept makes sense, right? Because you're you're cutting off this. Let's face it. When is the last time you saw an ad for Tesla? It's called never, right? <laughs> they don't they don't have to. So it makes sense to try and cut out the the first part, right, of of the transaction, which is the marketing and the and the sales part. The problem is, and. The problem is that there. what happens after that, right? Who's handling the claims that has the expertise? Who knows specifically, you know, where's the infrastructure for it? There are only so many public adjusters, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I think you're right that there's definitely going to be a segment of the market that can sort of come out and say, hey, we can try this. Group health, for example. Why is there not group auto, for another example, right? Why has that never been a thing? Yeah, I, I don't know. Is it a good idea? I really don't know. All I know is that, to to your point again, I think that what's going to give us that ability is some of this sophisticated modeling that exists that didn't used to, where these insurance companies can take large amounts of data and run a simulation and find out, would this actually be something that is going to make money or is this going to be something that loses money? And with that, they'll be able to innovate and be a little bit more flexible with with what it is that they're with their with, with what they're trying, and that hopefully translates into more products, more choices, and lower prices. And you know, Randall, we you and I could go on indefinitely for sure. And we we're, we are out of time right now, but I, I wanted to thank you so much for being here. I'd love to have you back again. There again, this is a moving target. This is a moving target, and it's it's tough right now for for consumers and for brokers and for insurers and for the legislators and the departments of everybody is sweating bullets over this. So I would love to be able to keep covering these types of issues and trying to help educate people and help just again turn that ship in just a slightly different direction so that people's expectations are a little bit different and their relationship with their policies are different as well. Absolutely. Yes, it's been a pleasure to be on the show. Absolutely. I do want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen today. I know insurance is not necessarily the most sexy concept. It's not the most exciting thing in the world. It is important that you understand what it is you're getting, what you should be looking for, red flags, you name it. You just need to know more than you used to. Things are more complicated than they used to be. If you have any questions, please reach out to me directly. You can email your questions to questions at insurancehour.com or call and leave a voicemail at 559 556-0317. Educating and entertaining Californians one insurance policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. The show is dedicated to Shamrock Papa.